Hello, it was two for one on chaos. So I just went ahead and got a bargain. <laughs> okay, so I today am introducing a new brand on my channel. It's gonna be Gen C. I'm sure y'all have heard of this on social media and whatnot, but they are part of one of the like affiliate partners that I use and they reached out and asked if they could send me some stuff. So I said yes, of course, because I have seen them a lot of places and been really interested in trying them. So I got to pick out some stuff on site. Everything from Gen C is gonna be uh, gifted in this video. It's not sponsored or anything, but I did, you know, I received these in PR. And so we're gonna be putting all of them on my face today. But we're also today going to be talking about this, this new buzzword, this new anti-buzzword, which is de-influencing. And the only reason that, you know, I keep hearing about it is both, well, commentary channels and like video essays that I like to watch. And then all of a sudden Tati just decided to use it as a buzzword in one of her titles and so I just couldn't help myself so yeah that's what we're gonna be chatting about today and let's go ahead and jump in so Gen C is just a kind of moderately priced I said like glossier price kind of beauty brand that focuses on like sustainable packaging and clean ingredients and they have some really beautiful colors very like user-friendly kinds of formulas and stuff so we'll talk about them individually as we go but I'm gonna start with my something has been on my channel in a minute my Mac Studio Radiance face and body I've been darkening all of my foundations lately like I keep buying them too light and if memory serves this is one that I actually bought in a slightly deeper shade so hopefully it works You're supposed to like work it until it starts to grip apparently I don't have the patience, girl. There we go. So <laughs> if you're unfamiliar with this, I'm sure, or even if you're like marginally familiar with this de-influencing word, I'm sure that the first thought that you had, if you're, you know, over 25, is TikTok thinks they invented something again. <laughs> It's this idea, right, that everybody's very sick of being sold to and they can't trust the recommendations that they're seeing, especially in the short form content on TikTok. And so a lot of people are making videos on TikTok, especially telling you what not to buy. So in this case, TikTok thinks that it invented the anti-haul. <laughs> which all credit goes to Kimberly Clark, a drag queen and creator on the platform who I don't think makes videos anymore, but I used to love their anti-hauls. And yeah, it's definitely something that's caught on for a long time here, but YouTube and TikTok seem really siloed. That's just kind of the, the pattern that we're all kind of observing. Although my friend Rachel, this is a kind of a sidebar, but my friend Rachel sent me a, uh, a TikTok this morning about how like YouTube is gonna come back and YouTube is about to come back because people are getting so tired of short form content and kind of the insincerity of it, which again is just part of this cycle that we went through with YouTube, we go through with every new platform and TikTok is just repeating the same steps. Yeah, so I have that in the shade N1. It's a, it's a very pretty match, not a whole lot of coverage. I think that it looks really healthy on me. So everything kind of is the wild west right when it starts you know the new platforms they become these places where kind of anything goes and that makes them kind of more inherently trustworthy because people see whether completely true or not that the creators on that platform are coming from a place of sincerity and their opinions are not influenced or swayed by money so monetization of one type or another, either the platform monetizing or a brand paying them to say something or review something. Because like I said, when Mascara Gate happened, we as creators, especially ones that have been kind of around for a while, have been working against this sort of assumption, right? That creators, influencers in general are willing to say anything for money and that like a sponsorship automatically means that you're not being completely honest about something because you there are just things that you're not allowed to say when you're partnering with a brand now what really is the case in most 
cases with most creators, that decision making is actually happening long before you actually see those products on camera. They're not going to accept a sponsorship for products that they don't like. It's only kind of creators that are working at such a quick clip and such a quick turnaround that might need to have it written into a contract with a brand. It's like, okay, I need to be able to be 100% honest reviewing your products if you send them to me, things like that, and still get paid versus kind of smaller creators who can't throw their weight around like that necessarily. That's a very, like, it's a very nuanced thing. But, you know, a lot of times you have to only review things that you like because you're being paid to say that you like it. So in order to be honest, you can only accept it if you like it kind of thing. Does that make sense? And so that's why, you know, creators that you'll see kind of like hope scope, she'll be like, well, you know, yeah, I'm getting paid by this brand to talk about this, but I was only going to do it if I could say exactly how I felt no matter what kind of thing. And so I think that those two kind of like developments, right, in the influencing space have made a really big difference in our ability to, again, you know, build trust as part of that parasocial relationship. But at the same time, a lot of what this entire job hinges on is building that trust because it's already, and I've said this before, it's already inherently kind of a touchy thing that we're getting paid to tell you our honest thoughts about anything because there is on just a completely like lizard brain level uh, a high incentive or you know increasing incentive as you grow to lie for money but that's if people are just you're assuming that people watching your channel are just drive-bys and that they're just completely like a renewable resource. But that is not the case. And you lose credibility, like you can't get that credibility back. And then you start to get a reputation online of not being a credible person. And like, to me, that's the scariest thing in the world. And I've always been incredibly delicate with, and that's why my videos are so long. <laughs> I've always been really delicate about talking about like the nuances of why I like something and what my expectations and needs are and things like that. And that's just obviously from a makeup standpoint. So what happened with TikTok inevitably is, you know, capitalism won, right? The brand saw an opportunity, like they're always going to. And I don't necessarily think that it's like, I mean, sure, it's an evil thing at the end of the day, but it's so inevitable. And I do think that, you know, obviously TikTok creator does not automatically equal dishonest influencer. And I think that that's what we're seeing a lot of right now is people trying to disassociate their own creator status or their own influencer status from the kind of like, you know, will shill anything for money kind of influencer trope. I'm gonna do blush first before I do like my bronzer and stuff so you can see the shades of all of these things more truly. But I wanna kind of wrap this thought up. I do kind of feel bad for the creators who again, have made integrity and building a, a trusting relationship with their communities top priority because it really, it's kind of this weird correlation where it like seems to always be the creators that grow the fastest that tend to fall victim to what happened to Michaela, basically. The money just speaks too loudly and they end up doing something that probably, you know, I don't know what's inside her, her head and her heart, but like it probably goes against their values. And so I do think that that's one of the things that's getting the ball rolling on this like de-influencing and just the idea of breaking, the other thing is breaking away from the idea of these constantly rotating aesthetics. That seems to be a thing that happened very Gen Z with, you know, you, having to put a, a label on everything it needing to be, for Christ's sake, y'all, a keyword, a search term. It is Your life has become an algorithm because you can basically go on Pinterest or Tumblr and type in the aesthetic of how you wanna like dress or look. Like you can shop on that Cider website and literally shop for the aesthetic or aesthetic as they all say it. There is an H in that word. The idea that like you have, you know, algorithmified your entire appearance and the way that you want to dress in order to like, you know, fit into a search term makes it so that you are then subject to the next revolution of that. And people are trying to break free from that. They don't like the way that it makes their brain feel like everything's gamified. And I think that we, and I'm, you know, I know I'm not putting on any makeup right now, I think that we as like millennials have this very specific viewpoint where we saw life before the internet. 
I mean, I know that the internet started in like 1981, but it became like, you know, America online when I was like nine years old. And that was when we could, you know, go online and like do online things and things were not as algorithmic or algorithmic at all. And it really was just kind of this like weird free for all experimentation, you know, internet 1.0 kind of thing. It was not at all what it is now. And so we have still in our memories, the feeling, like we still remember what that feeling was like where you read the back of a shampoo bottle because there was nothing else to do when you were going to the bathroom, you know? <laughs> like when you were bored, you played cat's cradle in school. Like we figured out stuff to do and it was cool. Like we went for walks and I'm not saying like the next generation doesn't go for walks, but like everything has to become a thing. Like we have to call it something in order for it to be like relevant. And I think that that's incredibly exhausting for this particular generation, like the Gen Z. Uh, and you know, I guess even there's probably an up, up, up and coming generation. Are they using phones yet? I don't know. My child is two and a half, but <laughs> I get it. And I get that that's where people are coming from in terms of wanting to be de-influenced. And I also get that it's like when my mother, when I tried to have my mother read How to Do Nothing, she was like, How to Do Nothing is again trying, it's a very millennial take, a very incredible millennial take on like how to break free from technology in your everyday life without just completely like running off and living in the woods. My mom read it and she was like, a duh. You know what I mean? Because like her generation, the baby boomer generation is like, why do y'all feel so inclined to just be completely obsessed with your phones? Although I would argue many boomers are still obsessed with their phones and they really hold the record for using the most emojis, but they do still know how to like putter. You know what I mean? They know how to just kind of like be in their house and read cookbooks, which is just not something with our Neptunes and Capricorn as a generation that we really like know how to do super well. Let's talk about Gen Z for a second. <laughs> because apparently I have more thoughts than I even knew how to take notes on before coming into this video. I'm gonna start with blush. Ooh, I didn't, I forgot they sent me a lipstick. We'll see, I didn't try that yet. So I have a blush, I have two eyeshadows, a matte and a kind of shimmer cream. I have a mascara, a lip gloss, a brow gel, a color brow gel and a, a lipstick. Yeah, so we're, oh, and did I say blush? And a mascara, a mascara. Where did the blush go? Okay, so this is the Clean Sheen Cheek and Lip Color. I got it in, I got it in Crash. I got it in Apricot. So this is $20 and comes in five shades and this one is just, it's just really gorgeous. It does remind me a lot of the cloud paint. It's not quite as, I wanna say like matte, Cloud paint's kind of matte. And it did make it so that it came off a little bit ashy on dark skin tones when it first came out before they came out with some more nuanced colors that were a little more translucent. So yeah, the way that this spreads out, it doesn't leave behind that kind of milky whiteness. So hopefully that means that it's going to translate to more skin tones. Also, when I've tried this before filming, I still see my freckles through it. So it doesn't really increase coverage with it, which I think is really nice. I'm using the 112 from BK here, but I love how, cause everything kind of turns pink on me. And so even though it's quite orange, I still think that once it all comes together, it's like, yeah, I'm kind of pushing the limits of what my undertones can really adapt to, but it's translucent enough that I think that it looks really, really like healthy and summery, which is what inspired me to put the shirt on today. <laughs> but every time I try and reach for an, like an apricot or a coral or a peach blush, I realize how many I have tried recently because they're all kind of sitting right around me right now. I have one from Too Faced. I have one from Danessa Myricks. I have one from Dior. I have one from Makeup by Mario. I, I like, I have so many, but this is really pretty. It builds really nicely. So it's like, once you get that initial layer down, it's not very slippy. It does dry down, but it has a nice kind of glycerin looking finish. Isn't that pretty? And so I feel like it's, it's not necessarily like blurring in the sense of having some kind of like mattification to it or uh, coverage, but it has a really gorgeous finish, very reminiscent to me of the like Milk Bionic blush, bronzer and glow, which y'all know is like one of my favorite formulas on the market because it does dry down, it does kind of set, but it looks beautifully like healthy and hydrated even when it's set down. Now let's talk about, 
as I'm putting a little more of this on. Let's talk about, you know, where an influencer, a professional influencer, falls and might feel, you know, a, a thrill of fear, as it were, when they hear something like, you know, TikTok being caught up in a sensation of de-influencing. It's like, oh my gosh, the entire career path is being canceled. I hate that word, it's so overused, but I am not afraid of that. I'm kind of, you know, I'm one of those like long-term investors, even like, you know, in the stock market. <laughs> Or it's like, I don't check on stuff, you know? I'm just very like, I really believe that, you know, if you just kind of do the the, the smart long-term thing and not the quick fix, then your investment will pay off in the long run while everyone else is just kind of worrying about the little finicks along the way, all the little blips. I'm more concerned with like the, the, the long waves of everything. And I'm, I'm a lot more patient about it than I used to be. I think that, you know, you hit a place, especially on, you know, as a YouTuber, where like, I was able to make it my career. And I have a dedicated enough community that I feel like, you know, by one way or another, I am going to get by. And for that reason, I don't feel like I need to be as eager to jump on every single trend. And I also think that that makes my content probably like more relaxing to settle into because I'm not putting pressure on you to be younger than you are or older than you are or change constantly because you know we all kind of love a long video here on YouTube and the other reason that I feel pretty secure in it besides the fact that there are you know there's these forecasts all the time that you know people are going to they're going to return to the land they're going to return to YouTube is just that one of the chief complaints that every one of us has had had in like my comments and stuff is that like beauty content doesn't really translate to short form very well because you can't communicate the performance of a product in short form content very well. It's usually a first impression and I swear to God if I see another girl applying a normal ass lip gloss like this, <sighs> it's a lip gloss. Okay, like the way that we cannot stop regurgitating the same kind of content of, of just people pretending that everything that is new is absolutely groundbreaking. I have a secret for you. Outside of some like nuances that might make something appeal specifically to your tastes, there is nothing new under the sun. Now, skincare is gonna be different, but like makeup performance wise, it's either gonna be good or it's gonna be excellent, or it's gonna be a dud. But nothing is going to be like worthy of that face. Okay, unless it's like one of those gadgets that like puts your makeup on for you and you're like, dang them! That did what it said it was gonna do. And now I don't have to do that anymore. Like, you know, get me a machine that puts my makeup on for me then I'll make that face. But like, I'm not going to pretend that a lip gloss is more than a lip gloss. And I think that that's what, like, the content I like to watch really hinges on is the holistic, all-encompassing take of, is it good because you like it? Is it good because you think someone else is gonna like it? Do you, with your eyes, as you're seeing me put it on, like the appearance of it. Do we have the same needs? You know what I mean? So I'm gonna get into kind of a, a, a list of recommendations of like how to break the spell. That's what I always call it. Like de-influence yourself, but I always call it breaking the spell because I, I don't wanna call myself any kind of expert, but I do know how to put makeup on my face in a way that usually tries to highlight the best qualities of that makeup because I kind of know what works on me. I do this literally like more than one time every single day for the past going on like now it's over five years, you know, and most people don't put makeup on that often. So I'm going to know my face pretty well at this point. And so I do feel a need to break the spell in terms of like the viewer getting kind of caught up in what can look sort of magical because I know my face really well. Okay. So let's, Let's take a break from, from that for a second because I don't seem to be able to make full thoughts and put makeup on at the same time. So we're gonna go in with some eyeshadow here. So this is, I have the shade Reef and this is this really beautiful, uh, you know, it looks, it looks brown, but I know me, I know that that's going to go orangey pink on me. 
trust me. So this is the matte eyeshadow, and then I have Bronze Age, and this is the shimmer eyeshadow. So I'm gonna start with this, and I'm going to kind of dab it on and then go in with my LH Cosmetics 303 to just kind of spread it out. This is with a synthetic brush, and it just does a good job of not soaking up cream products, basically. So my first recommendation for, you know, breaking the spell, especially when you're watching something like TikTok, but on any platform, on Instagram, ads, whatever, believe your eyes, okay? Believe your eyes. That's the thing that like, I just feel like keeps getting, it's almost insulting because brands, especially kind of like small brands going for the, like the short-term cash grab, uh, like selling on Amazon or something, they are trying to capitalize on like the most played out visual gimmicks uh, that you can get with a filter, you know, and they are shameless. No one is going to hold them accountable because they're just a random brand doing a blip of an ad. They don't have any reason to like build loyalty with you. They just want that like, that's that snap reaction and for you to check out. And I know that it's probably not more seasoned internet users who, you know, need to hear this. It's mainly like, you know, kids, but at least we can use this information to equip our kids and whatnot, that most, no, well, I guess the, the TikTok girlies are getting into uh, flip phones now, and so they like to film things or they like to take pictures that are in low quality for, you know, aesthetic purposes. But uh, for the most part, you know, when you see a tutorial or a review, you're looking at something that was filmed on an iPhone or, you know, a really nice, like a pixel or something, and they film in HD. Uh, yes, you do have to kind of opt in sometimes on Instagram in order to actually like upload high quality video because sometimes it will upload all grainy, but most people don't do that but like once or twice on accident. They're like, ugh, why does this not work? And then they figure out why and then they fix it kind of thing. Most of what we're watching is in 4K. I do know that TikTok I think only goes to 1080p, but y'all, for years my videos have been in 1080p. I'm pretty sure, pretty sure that Hannah films in 1080p. Okay, that is the crispness of 1080p, not this kind of like blurry soft focus that you see in the beauty reviews on TikTok, okay? And so when you see things that just look uncanny to you, when they're kind of hitting that part of your brain that's like the, the uncanny valley reaction of blur, believe your eyes, believe your instincts, okay? Like that, the reason that it looks that way is because they're trying to fool you. They are trying to blur things to death. They are using some kind of cheap gimmick. Like, did you know that not only can you use Facetune to Facetune your face, but you can apply it to video now. They have Facetune too, and you can literally doctor video. And it can, you know, change the person's face in real time. You don't have to be someone with like an algorithm to be able to do like a Tom Cruise deep fake in order to do it. Like you can just doctor your features and it can be a video and really no one would be the wiser. Believe your eyes and at the same time, like, believe your brain, okay? Because if something looks too good to be true, and this also goes for like influencers who have just like these perfectly golden ratio proportioned faces, you know, that they look like Russian porcelain dolls or something, y'all, that's just, that's just Facetune. Like they don't really look like that. They just know that like they're going to get more followers and stuff doing that. And so they honestly like don't even really care about again, building a, a relationship of sincerity with any kind of following, they're really out for something else. There's absolutely no reason to compare yourself to something like that because it's just, it's, it's literally, it's literally like CGI. <laughs> <laughs> you might as well be watching Avatar. I definitely recommend following like Danae Mercer. She's incredible. She's incredible at like showing you the realities of like what you can do with like fancy filters and apps and camera work and like what how what you're seeing isn't real at all. Like you're like, wow, so-and-so must have gotten some, you know, fillers or a nose job. No, you know, it's a lot cheaper than fillers in a nose job. Filtering all of your photos with Facetune, like it's not that hard. Like a lot of these things have presets on them and you can just snap them onto every photo like and I kind of feel bad for those girlies who are doing that to all their photos because then like their own faces are kind of a surprise to them. <laughs>
Mm, that's sad. So anyway, that's my that's my first recommendation. I'm gonna now go in with this right here. So again, this is Bronze Age. I'm gonna go kind of on the lids with it. It goes really well with this color. Like I'm just very impressed with the way that they kind of mishmash together and then we'll go in with, you know, other touches that for the moment won't be Gen C. But my second recommendation is consider the source, right? I mean, yes, we just talked about how someone might not even be out here trying to build a, a sincere relationship based on integrity with a following, sure. But I actually mean, in terms of like, parting with your money, consider whether the person that you're watching, me, has the same wants and needs as you. I always try and tell y'all in pretty much every video, in case it's like the first video you're watching, like, this is my skin type, I have dry skin. I am 35. I have Botox in my forehead. I have filler in my lips. I live in the Northeast and so it's cold outside and so, you know, the needs that I have are, are more about hydration than about my makeup lasting all day. And I, am prone to acne and sun damage. And you know what I mean? Like just things like that. That's like, do we have the same needs from our products? These are all things to, I don't know why that one smells absolutely lovely. I don't think that the other one has a scent, does it? This one doesn't smell like anything. <laughs> that's so weird. <laughs> what a choice. Maybe it's just like, Maybe they found a reason that like it, they needed to add a vanilla ingredient in here, but this smells divine. This shade, the other one didn't smell like anything, but this one smells noticeably like vanilla and it's delightful. Like I've never had an eyeshadow smell like vanilla before, but vanilla is kind of my kink. So anyway, it's about comparing, you know, sure the magic, but like breaking the spell of whether or not what they're finding really appealing in a product is something that you're gonna find a feeling appealing in a product because you might have very, very different needs. And I think that that's incredibly valuable to just kind of break that spell. Like I watch Hannah all the time. Like I watch every single video that she does because she's one of my best friends and I love her very, very much. And I always like appreciate her takes on things. I just like the way her mind works. And when she likes a product, I'm always very intrigued by that because she is not just discerning about how she spends her money, but she's got funky needs, you know what I mean? She's just got very interesting wants and needs from like texture and color and coverage and stuff. And so I always try and remember that about Hannah's wants and needs before I like, you know, pull the trigger on getting something that she really likes because we really do have different makeup needs. I have that like straight down the middle of like for my whole life, I, I mean, for better or for worse, I'm not saying they were always a perfect match, but like most of the time growing up, I could walk into the drugstore, go to the lightest shade in their foundation range and it would be a match. Cause I am what I call basic white girl TM. You know, I am neutral, fair. Like that is my skin tone. She's not, she is like such a desaturated, olive that very, very few shade ranges actually have anything for her. And so I have more opportunities because of the nature of shade ranges on the makeup market. I have a lot more opportunities to try things than she does. I mean, yes, she can try any lipstick or any eyeshadow or anything like that. But like when it comes to things that go directly on her complexion, blushes and bronzers, contours and, and foundations and concealers and powders, she is extraordinarily limited. And so a lot of times, like I look at things that she really likes and I realize like there's a unique appeal to that thing that she likes because it caters to those specific needs of like how few things actually cater to her specific needs. So it's not about not trusting influencers because they're inherently influencers. It's about being able to appreciate nuanced opinions on something, their honest review, the visual that they're able to like back up their opinions with and all of the caveats of their wants and needs, being able to separate that from like the entertainment value of watching someone enjoy something because there's really a lot to that. I love watching someone enjoy something. I love watching Lauren May put on makeup. We have such different eye colors and eye shapes, but the eye looks that she does are so lovely. They're just so lovely. She's just got this amazing, like just plane of like, you know, gorgeous real estate right there. And just these big light eyes that pop with all these like, you know, glistening golds that she puts on her eyes. I like watching her enjoy something. And it doesn't 
always translate to me wanting to go buy every like Moira eyeshadow, although she is tempting me on those Moira eyeshadows. Same thing with like Amanda. I, you know, I'm going to watch Amanda enjoy something and rave about something, but I understand that like she doesn't mind seeing her skin on her eyes through her eyeshadow. Where I like opacity because I am self-conscious about my veins underneath my eyelids and stuff like that. And so it's about kind of recognizing that even though someone seems like they kind of look like you or have your same skin tone or have your same needs, because all of those people are kind of, you know, white girls, that like you don't necessarily relate to all of their needs and all of their wants and their particular caveats. And so that inherently breaks the spell, but you can still enjoy their content, you know? Part of me regrets going on that whole tirade with my eyes looking like this. I'm gonna use something to like clean this up. I'm gonna just kind of grab, I think like a concealer brush and just kind of clean up around the edges. That is one thing with liquid shadows is they kind of tend to run away. This one doesn't dry down completely, completely. It stays a little bit movable. Next I'm going to put on contour and bronzer because we are just swiftly approaching orange face. I know I'm kind of hitting y'all with all of the flavors of it lately. I've done pink face, I've done purple face. So I'm going to, you know, add the nuances back in of like bronzer and contour. I'm going to use my Patrick Ta. Y'all, I thought that I was opening this earlier today and it was actually the foundation and powder combo and the powder just shattered all over me and I was like, oh. <laughs> I guess you heard we were talking smack about you. <laughs> so my third way of kind of breaking the spell, it's a very Hannah mindset. And I think that Hannah is always a great, Hannah Louise Poston is a great palette cleanser in terms of, you know, really thinking hard about purchases and things like that before you make them and not making, you know, kind of snap decisions. And talking about that mindset of like, you know, where you're at when you're actually like, are you in some kind of trance when you're, you know, making purchases and things like that. But I recently watched a video by uh, Tiffany Ferg. Do you, do, do y'all watch her because I love her? She does internet analysis and she talks about, you know, what does she say? Topics relevant to social, to, yeah, to social something and media. And she was talking about de-influencing mainly as it pertains to interior decorating. And one of the things that she was really encouraging was considering the life cycle of a product. Where is this thing going to be for me a year from now or five years from now or whatever the headband's coming off? Yes, it is. I think that that's incredibly important when it comes to a makeup purchase or something like that because you have to think like, do I already have something or have I traced these steps before? That's another one that's huge for me, especially with like clothes I look and I'm like, ooh, that's nice. Wait a second. I remember having the same feeling. Did I already satisfy this urge? And then I go to my like my wardrobe or my jewelry collection or whatever and I say, yes, the last time that I was inspired by this particular spark, I picked this up and that means I'm going to go back to that thing. And it was a decisive purchase. It was something that I'm glad that I got. And so I don't need to go and like re-scratch that itch because I already scratched it kind of thing. And that's why I don't think that there's anything wrong necessarily with acquiring new things. I think that, you know, loving beauty for the sake of beauty, and I mean beauty in all things, is what life is made of, okay? I, I am not a minimalist. I will never be a minimalist, okay? Not aesthetically, not philosophically. I am just a chaos individual and I have learned to embrace it because it's what makes me happy. Not a referendum on anybody else. But something that Tiffany was kind of unpacking, <laughs> this segues nicely, is the idea of like these aesthetics that are going around, you know, and have been on TikTok for so long and how if you found one appealing, let's say, you know, like an all gray interior or something like that, and you found that to be appealing to you and you put a bunch on your Pinterest wall and stuff like that a year ago or two years ago or something, now you might look at it and go, God, that's so dated. Why in the world would interior decor from two years ago feel dated? It shouldn't. It should be a reflection of your taste and that should never feel dated. Do you, does that make sense? It's not so much about like, you can't be a minimalist or you can't decorate with gray. It's just about the motivation behind it, whether you feel like you're doing it in an effort to like keep up because it's going to, you know, manifest some kind of fantasy in your life where it's like, as soon as you paint all of your walls white, you're going to suddenly become a minimalist. That probably works for like 1% of people and like good for you. 
good for those people. You know what I mean? Like, I think that that's a, there's a reason it exists. It's, it's a beautiful, calming environment, but I'm going to mess it up in two seconds flat with my stuff. <laughs> and I like my stuff. And so it's more about the motivation. It's not, it's not about like, you know, this is wrong and this is right, or you're not allowed to have like a Joanna Gaines modern farmhouse. It's just about whether you're doing it because it's something that you like, or you're doing it because it's something that you were influenced to do and you almost felt kind of pressured to do. And that like a lot of people seem to, I know it, it feels foreign to me. It feels foreign to me to be pressured to decorate my house a certain way. Like that feels odd to me, but I, in the same way that it felt weird for my mom to read about like needing to detach yourself from social media and like that being something that's actually a struggle day to day. I think Gen Z has this very familiar kind of feeling of like being pressured to have certain aesthetics in their surroundings or in their clothes that like millennials are kind of like, really? You know, like just dress however you want. And, and decorate your house however you want. Do whatever you want. Do what makes you happy. And I feel like almost like Gen Z has been told these are the things that make people happy and this is what those things look like and these are the names for those things. And so they've uh, maybe not asked themselves in a lot of cases or maybe no one has asked them what makes them happy. And the beauty of that is that's a really fun question to ask yourself. It's kind of like when I got out of my first college relationship and I was like single for the first time since I was 15 and I went, oh God, I'm single. Oh God, I don't know who I am. And then I went, ooh, this is a fun thing to define. Like I get to decide who I am now. Like I get to decide what my interests are. Like if you're someone who thinks that, you know, you're interests have kind of always maybe been over influenced or steered by an algorithm or what's being shown to you. Maybe take a step back and like do the freeing thing of going, what am I interested in? What do I like? What feels really good when I'm engaging with it? Because chasing that feeling is actually going to lead you in the other direction from all of that like, you know, aesthetic inspo. If, if that's where you're trying to go. All right, I'm going to go in with some of the Lisa Eldridge Cressida Liquid Lorax, and I'm gonna use that to kind of just lighten up and brighten on my on my eyes, and I'll do kind of my, my eyeliner. Maybe I'll sneak in a mystery item that I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> this is my one kind of biased take. You know, this is my opportunity to be biased real quick, and that is, to say that, you know, my next tip, my next tip for consuming content online, especially, you know, if you do find it entertaining, not just an opportunity to spend money or be told how to think. I don't think anyone's looking for that, but no, they probably are. Anyway, long form content is inherently more trustworthy. I know I kind of already touched on this, so I won't spend too long here, but it's inherently more trustworthy because you are getting a much more of a chance to actually build a relationship with what you're seeing. Not necessarily the person, yes, the person, sure, but with what you are actually looking at. You can use your eyes to make your own judgments and it's not this like flash in the pan thing where, you know, you're just getting a glimpse of a uh, before and after and trying to make some kind of snap purchase decision. And I don't necessarily feel like long form content places you co constantly in a decision to buy binary. I feel like I have a lot of fun consuming content on YouTube that has nothing to do. And I can make it have nothing to do with whether or not I wanna buy something. My husband sees me absolutely just shopping constantly, but really what I'm doing is I have a passion for getting the lay of the land. I really wanna understand what's out there. It's kind of like reading fashion magazines or something. And so I really wanna understand the lay of the land from a fashion standpoint. And I really wanna understand the lay of the land from a, a beauty standpoint. Just knowing what's out there is really comforting to me for recommendations and also for just being more of an authority on you know my job in general. For example, a, a friend of mine reached out and she was just like, hey, you know, these shoes sold out that I really liked. Do you know of anything else that like this within the same price range and I found her something for a third of the price that she liked even better. She's like, how did you do that so fast? It was like in five minutes because I have just a, sort of a, a, a flash drive memory of like what's 
doing what right now? Like what brands are doing what right now? Like what their vibe is, what they're leaning into, who they're partnering with, things like that. And so I was able to go, okay, well, this, this brand has been doing this lately and I know these colorways and I know this website carries this specific colorway and I think that it, you know, and I found it on sale, blah, blah, blah. To me, like that's kind of the way that I enjoy content a lot of times is just sort of understanding, is, you know, gaining an understanding of what's, of what's happening. But the main thing is I feel like you are building a relationship that doesn't necessarily have to translate into pulling your wallet it out. You know, you can just take in that content and appreciate that moment with that person who is entertaining you. You know, you don't watch Ina Garden and immediately buy something, right? Just because she's using a bunch of really great things, it doesn't mean that you're going online and buying the good vanilla. It doesn't have to be that way. And so I think that like going into it with the right mindset a lot of times is really key. What am I looking for today? Like, am I looking for a specific product, same way you would if you were going shopping and, you know, go and find the review? Or am I just looking to like dissociate? And if you're looking to dissociate, like put on a long form video with someone that you feel like, you know, is a, is like a comfort watch kind of thing. And like, I don't think that YouTube in, in and of itself is designed or has, you know, from a practical standpoint, become a platform that is just a series of commercials, the way that, the way that like more short form content has become. That's just kind of my personal take on it. And my, my final big take home, and it's kind of what I feel like I've been getting at the whole time, is figuring out what you like. And again, it's, it's a really like positive exercise because it's just kind of fun to go through your normal kind of channels. I am not liking this brush. It's so thick. Going through your normal kind of channels and instead of being kind of the victim of what someone's going to say to you or sell to you, instead you're going in as a critic and being like, it's your job to make whatever it is, give me a feeling, make it resonate with me, make it mean something. And when you go into it with that mindset, you get to just become this enjoyer, right? A, a spectator of things. And then you start to notice the feeling that you get when something really like resonates with you, especially something visually. So I like to do this on Pinterest. And sure, you know, you can search aesthetics all day long, but I think that something good to do is just look at like, you know, outfit inspo or whatever, just like, or like a, a color story or something. And then just go to that photo and just keep scrolling underneath it. And sometimes, you know, obviously it all gets very repetitive, but you start to hone the instinct of what feels resonant to you instead of that weird kind of ick that you get where you feel like you're comparing yourself to something else. And for me, you know, I live this very colorful existence. And it took me a long time to come to terms with the fact that like everything about my life is probably going to be kind of colorful and loud. And I like, I like things. I like maximalism. I like when st stuff just kind of vibrates with life force. And that is not everyone's comfort zone, but it feels like a warm hug to me all the time. It feels like everything's very alive. And that is something that like, if I were to go to the internet at any time in the last 10 years, I'm not sure that I would have had it necessarily reflected back to me as like the thing that was, you know, hip and cool or whatever. It's like, because eclectic is a really hard thing to kind of nail down. And so it's not necessarily like an aesthetic that's super like sellable. I, I don't know for sure. I don't watch TikTok, but it just feels like, you know, it's, it's that kind of like curated, life that I'm not trying to say like, oh, I'm so, I'm so above it all. But it's, it's more just that like, I do feel like my surroundings have absolutely nothing to do with anything the internet has ever told me was cool. You know, like I have my friend's art. I have the colors that I like and I just get waves of inspiration. And that's what I use to kind of, you know, translate to how I decorate my house. I have artists that I know that I like, and it all kind of comes with time. And I think that that's a really important thing to take into consideration is that like, 
it's not about right this second. And the internet would love to have you think it's right about this second. It's about right this second, because that's what's going to make you push add to cart and check out, okay? And that's what's going to make them the money. But the whole point is to curate. The whole point is to create something that is within your own paradigm. Create your own paradigm of your own strong, clear instincts of what makes you feel awesome, you know? And let that be your guiding force because guess what? When you have your own motivations and you know who you are and you know what you like and you know like what actually like feels resonant and feels just totally like imbued with life force when you engage with it, it actually feels good when you engage with it. It doesn't give you that weird sensorial, like overwhelming anxious ick that you get when you are engaging with something that feels like it's putting some kind of like you're behind and you need to catch up kind of pressure that you get from other things on the internet. So that's how you know, like you can start to trust your gut in terms of like, am I doing this because this feels like something I want to do? Or am I doing this because I feel like if I don't, I'm falling behind. It was kind of something that took me a really long time to understand as a kid, because I would always wonder why I didn't fit in with like the cool, the cool kids, right? I'm not, where's my, I want like a, something glittery on my eye. I am afraid that I'm going to have to use something that I'm not going to be able to tell you about today. And y'all can all guess in the comments what it is. You can all guess in the comments. It'll only be a few weeks before I can reveal what this is. but. I realized that the difference between me and the cool kids was that the cool kids were doing the cool stuff because it was what they liked. And I was trying to keep up with the cool kids by doing what they liked. But I didn't have any internal compass for what they liked because I didn't actually like it. <laughs> so it became something where I was like, well, maybe instead of following, the answer is to lead. And leading is really scary. It is. Leading is scary because it's a lot of unknown. You know, I think that that's kind of the other thing is like people are not, they're, they're taking their too much time to tell you how to think instead of taking the time to teach you how to think for yourself. Right? There's so much power in saying the words, I don't know. And like letting that just kind of be what it is because you don't know until you stumble on it sometimes and you can't force an epiphany in terms of like, you know, what you like and coming across something that you like kind of thing. And you'll get better at it, but it's not really about optimizing it. It's about it being this like lifelong fun process of like building your own story. And I feel like that being the motivation of just becoming this cool collage of all of your experiences in life and letting that inform like how you want to engage with the things around you and like the makeup that you use and the way that it you know lets you express yourself that is always going to like i said lead you in the opposite path of feeling like you're kind of following along with what the internet is telling you to do and it's going to lead you towards like more fulfilling acquisitions of like beautiful things in your life. It's not about buying someone else's life. Okay, so I have here, they're the Gen C, oh my God, it's so tiny. It's just an eyebrow mousse, it's a tinted eyebrow mousse and it's in medium brown, but I would like to know what dark brown looks like because, oh my word, it is like really dark, like shoe polish dark, but it's okay. Like we'll make it work, but it is definitely a look. Like I like the formula. I just, the color is so dark for a medium brown. <gasps> I'm gonna let that chill for a second, then I'm gonna go in with clear brow gel and try and kind of break it up a little, cause it's just, it's darker than my natural hair by a lot. And I'm gonna go in now with this mascara, which I think very highly of. I think it's great. The wash off is a little bit weird. I wanna say it's somewhere in between a tubing mascara and a regular wash off because it kind of like washes off in like, hunks but 
it didn't bother me. Like it was really easy to wash off. It was just different. I, I know that I just kind of raved about the Amicole because the Amicole is incredibly consistent. It makes a really beautiful, like thicker, fuller, longer lash just all the way across the board. This gives you fluff. It gives you this beautiful, fluffy, fluttery look to your lashes. It doesn't apply a ton to the actual like ends. And so if you are allergic to the little balls that go on the end of your lashes sometimes with some mascaras. It's like that's something that's like your t number one pet peeve. Maybe try this one because I feel like it does such a good job of just lifting and separating and doing a little bit of curling and like really defining, but it doesn't start to build up clumpies on the ends of your lashes. It's really nice. It might be the, just the brush. So I think that like everything that I have just gone over comes back to self-love because, or actually it kind of leads to self-love because I think that what all of these things are doing, especially in the beauty industry, but you know, trying to sell you anything is trying to capitalize on your perceived shortcomings and that's, you know, capitalizing on your insecurities and sometimes they have to create those insecurities themselves. So it's really about trying to gird your loins as it were, right? By being the strongest version of yourself that you can be by investing into yourself, investing into your own interests, into your own personality. Because I really believe that when you do the things that you know that you want to do, like if you want to write or if you want to make music or you know any kind of creative endeavor, any kind of any endeavor, you know what I mean? Going and studying the subject that you want to study or whatever, like those are the kinds of things that make you more you with every single thing that you do, every single like moment of your life that you invest in them. And they build confidence because you know that there's a certain part of yourself that no one can touch. It is always time well spent to invest into your own interests. And it does take a little bit of believing in yourself and it does take a little bit of kind of pushing yourself past some insecurity sometimes, but eventually your interests will become the thing that you can like lead in, you know? Do y'all see just the flutter of this mascara? It's absolutely gorgeous. Like look how just like soft and natural that looks. It's like the soft and natural with impact. It's not like soft and natural, where is it, you know? Oh, it's beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Now we get into all of my finishing touches here. So I think we're gonna go with a little bit of powder underneath my eyes, just to kind of like take the shine down. I think that it can just be, you know, I always say it's a little bit distracting. And you'll just be surprised what falls into place when you take that distraction of the shine away. Like everything just starts to look a little bit more put together because you can focus on the stuff that you spent so much more time on. like you know, eyeliner. And I feel like because the blush is so translucent, it leaves me wanting something that's like a focal point of like a nice bright pink on the top of my cheeks. Not a purpley pink, not like a Dior Rosy Glow, you know, 001 pink, but yeah, I think even though this is the Cloud Crush and Tequila Sunset, I still think that that's gonna be pink enough to to get the job done here. And I want it to be, you know, pretty vivid. So this is, yeah, Too Faced Cloud Crush Blurring Blush. And again, just that little bit of powder helps to change the way that the light hits. It's a lot heavier on this side than the other side. I don't love that. There we go. It is coconut scented. Not, not a huge fan of that. Could have skipped me on that one. But I do, I do like that. And I think that the very overwhelming thing here is my eyebrows. So let's go in with some clear brow gel and just try and make them look a little bit, a little bit less severe. Okay, I think that's a, a, a little bit better. And I'm gonna take the Victoria Beckham like waterline pencil here and I'm gonna use it in the waterline to really just like add a pop back into my eyes because they're just sort of looking a little bit like, you know, one blur. <laughs> so I just wanna define. And I also wanna add that a little bit like right here. This is a Trevor Barrett thing. Actually putting that pencil like right there so that you get that brightening. Now we're gonna talk about lips. <laughs> my eyebrows look wild. <laughs> this is the lipstick that I picked out that they sent and it is in the shade Toby. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if 
that's gonna go on my face today. Whoa. I mean, why not? Why not? That's what Hilary Duff would say. Let's give it a, let's give it a shot. It's just makeup. That's much, I don't know what I thought, but like that's pink. It's a pretty berry pink. A nice, secure matte formula. Like it doesn't feel like it's slipping around at all. Do I love that? I kind of love that. Okay, I love that. And it's something to compete with my eyebrows for star of the show, so. <laughs> uh, matte lip lovers rejoice. That's a pleasure to put on. I don't know how it's gonna wear. This is my first time ever trying it. Wow. <laughs> I think that it's a good thing I put this shirt on today because, you know, it can stand up to all the makeup. Okay, I mean, I am not mad at that lip color at all. That's beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful with this. <laughs> That's really good news because they did also send me a lip gloss. And I will see if I can resist this time, but I couldn't stop laughing when I was trying to use it before. Wait for it. Wait for it. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but when it came out, it looked like that. <laughs> okay, I was trying to use it and I just. <laughs> Look over there! Ah! Yeah, it's pretty impossible to use. I mean, I can kind of do a little bit of that. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord. <laughs> yeah, it's not, you can't, you can't use the applicator. I tried to bend it back, it's not, it's bent like back up. Uh, I'm gonna just blend it in a little with the lipstick here. I don't know if that's a condition that happened with anyone else's lip gloss, but it did render mine slightly unusable, so I, I am, I'm sorry about that. All right, so yeah, let's go through the prices really quickly and then I'm gonna give y'all my thoughts on each of these products. So like I said, the Clean Sheen Lip and Cheek, the blush that I use, $20 and there are five shades. The Pick Me Up Lip Matte Lipstick is $22, comes in eight shades. The Mixed Media Matte Liquid eyeshadow comes in two shades and it's $24. The Spectator Sport Mascara is $23, only comes in black. The Clean Sheen Lip Gloss <laughs> comes in clear and it is $20. The Arch Support Brow Powder Gel is $22 and comes in three shades. Probably should have gone with the, the lightest one for me. The Mixed Media Metallic Liquid Eyeshadow, which has that lovely vanilla scent, is $24 and there are three shades. And then they have, you know, little, like they have a makeup bag, the two makeup bags, and uh, a cotton scrunchie so far. So they do claim to be, you know, clean, vegan, and sustainable. I think that the, you know, the packaging and the, even the outer packaging is really, you know, it's just cool, it's current, it's different, but for a reason. I like kind of the minimalism, but also like the bright color to it. So speaking to each product individually, here. I will say that the blush balm, it's really nice, but it is translucent. So bear that in mind. I mean, that's going to be good news for a lot of people and it does come in several shades, but building it to opacity is just not something that it's going to do. It just doesn't have that to it. And so it's like, you almost need to, you know, have a more full coverage complexion product underneath or hit it with some powder or something after the fact, if you want to get it to opacity, because it's always going to remain a little bit translucent. You're always going to be able to see whatever's underneath. So uh, that's, you know, my only real critique, but I really like the color and I really like the formula. I think it's very, very pretty and it looks really like nourishing and hydrated on the skin. But you know, breaking the spell as it were, like, do I think that this is like the most groundbreaking thing in the world? No, it's more about whether the product itself and the, you know, sustainability practices and like the clean ingredients and the vegan quality of it, like the entire thing, the packaging and stuff like actually appeals to you and is something that you would want to engage with every day. It's not really out here trying to be this like groundbreaking, like, you know, from space kind of blush formula or any of these formulas necessarily. They are going to perform. And I definitely think that they're like light years above like the first time that I tried Say Beauty, for example, you know, just the absolute like, 
like phoned in formulas that they had. Like these are all very considered formulas. And they do say that they're gonna tell you pretty much with every single product, like what is in the packaging. So like for this one, the packaging is 35% post-consumer recycled materials. So it's not 100% recycled, but 35% recycled. And that's more than you could say for a lot of brands. And they're, you know, the transparency is also commendable. As far as the eyeshadows are concerned, I think these are actually my favorite part. Like I do think that, you know, this obviously exists elsewhere, but I do usually have a lot of trouble working with liquid eyeshadows and I did not have very much trouble working with these. And I also think, especially when I'm thinking about something like Violette FR, when she put out her Yo paints uh, initially and just other, especially matte cream eyeshadows. Now this could easily probably be duped in like the Ulta ones, although I'm not sure that they have any that are like this nuanced as far as like going on kind of, you know, that, that peachy color on me. I just think that like this formula doesn't complain. It's very easy to work with. And while yes, it's creasing a little bit, it is creasing a little bit. I do kind of like that it stays slightly movable because it helps you continue to work on top of it. Whereas like the Violette FR ones, it was kind of, it was kind of punishing. It was just so difficult to get it done in time. And once it was down, it was down. But I think that these are unique and different for a reason. I like the colors that they chose. I like the performance of the products. And especially in light of something like, you know, Glossier's first attempt at eyeshadows when they did the Lid Star and the the paints, whatever those paints were that they did on the eyes, they were pretty frustrating. And I feel like they concentrated, Gen C concentrated their efforts on putting out products that like have impact and are beautiful. And I feel like if you are someone who wants a very soft wash of color, you can get that out of these. And if you want so something that really builds up, they have a lot of versatility to them, which is just the name of the game for me, especially when it's like something that's supposed to be kind of minimal to your entire routine. You know, these are minimal packaging. These are versatile colors kind of thing. You want to be able to get more than one look out of them. And I feel like they did consider that when they were putting these together. The lip, the lip gloss is obviously a <laughs> The lip gloss is obviously a dud. I have no idea how I feel about the formula. I don't, I don't know because it just keeps doing that and it's just so silly. I've ever seen, but I had no idea anything like that would crack me up that much. I cannot speak to the formula, but the mishap with the wand is one of the funnier things I've seen in a while. <laughs> lipstick completely blew my mind. I mean, I shouldn't say that it like completely blew my mind in terms of like being something brand new. I think that it more blew my mind in the sense that like I thought it was going to completely overwhelm this look and it didn't. It looks really nice. It's a great color. Like even if I were wearing just like a you know, like it was in the last video, like a black turtleneck or something. I feel like this is a statement lip that doesn't completely steal the show. And it's a really easy formula to apply. And I, I like the, I like the bright orange, the kind of like matte. And this just feels, <laughs> this specifically feels like what, you know, Simi Hayes was going for and they missed the mark so hard. This is minimal, but it is memorable. And it doesn't have like that crazy bulk to it. And it's gonna be, you know, they're gonna be honest about the fact that it's got post-consumer material to it. So it says the packaging is 100% polypropylene, a mono material that is designed to be easily recyclable. All parts, including the internal ones, are made of the same type of plastic, making sorting and recycling easier. All you need to do is rinse well and throw the whole thing in the recycling bin. Unlike many other lipsticks, the base has no magnet because magnets cannot be recycled and go straight into landfills. Now, I mean, yes, that does mean that it's virgin plastic. It, at least they're being transparent about that, but you know, we could do better. And colored plastic doesn't really have much of a pathway to being recycled currently. So we can all do better on that. I do think that maybe aesthetics were chosen above sustainability in terms of this packaging. And the reason that I call that out is because they call it out. The, br <laughs> the brow gel. I'm not mad at her. I just don't know in what world this is medium brown. <laughs> It kind of looks like shoe polish. And if you're only gonna put out three shades and this is the medium one, yikes, yikes, we need more shades. We need more shades stat. So yeah, this is um, this is one of the more extreme uh, browns I've ever used on my eyebrows and it's 
it's just a lot. It's just a lot. So I'm not even really sure I can speak specifically to the formula, although, you know, it did a fine job. I just would really like to, you know, be able to try it in a color that didn't look quite so silly on me and be able to give a much truer review on it. And just be warned if you are complected like me and you're looking for a medium brown, this is not medium brown. <laughs> Get the lightest one. I do want to say some really nice things about the mascara. The mascara is uniquely lightweight and fluttery looking. And I think that, you know, I have been trying a lot of really great mascaras lately that are not my, you know, typical kind of like Thrive Tubing mascara. And I've grown in my ability to talk to the nuanced differences between the way that they look. And a lot of times, you know, we see, we see videos talking about how you can know what a mascara is going to make your lashes look like by looking at the wand itself, you know? And so here's the Ami Cole one that I was using yesterday. And then here is this one from Gen C. And you can, you can really see how the Gen C one is, is imitating, right? Those more like, elongated fluffy lashes that are a little bit more uh, concentrated at the roots, whereas the one from Micole is going to give you that more consistent, lengthened, and volumized lash. But they both do a really good job of maintaining curl. They're both really lightweight. I will say the Micole one seems to curl on its own somehow. I feel like it actually made my eyelashes curl, whereas this one is just lightweight enough that I feel like it would hold a curl, you know? And they both dry really nicely, like really quickly. So I feel like the world is really, really coming along on clean mascara formulas that actually perform because for the longest time we were just at sea. I mean, it was just not possible. You could not get a clean mascara formula that didn't just like smudge everywhere within the first 10 minutes. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm getting so many more opportunities to give positive reviews to mascaras lately. So yeah, this is the vibe today. I mean, with the exception of the eyebrows, like I'm a really big fan. This is just, this is just wild. The eyebrow situation is wild, but you know, it's just makeup. We live, we laugh, we learn. And I hope that y'all enjoyed today's chat today as well. I really wanted this to be a quicker video, but in my form lately, my typical form, I think you know, this is probably gonna be another hour long video. I, I'm sorry, I don't know, but I'll be able to reveal the thing that I used last on my eyes within a couple of weeks, so. Stay tuned for that. And if you did enjoy this video, please do give it a thumbs up. If you're new here and you made it all the way to the end of the video, thanks. You should probably subscribe because this is what my videos are like most of the time. And I hope you all had fun. I will put a video up here that I think that you will enjoy if you enjoyed this one. And I want to thank you for watching and for hanging out with me today. I love y'all so much and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.